Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope back uh, to, or, or for the first time, actually, uh, to part 21 of our series, uh, uh, Libraries in Response. Um, uh, today is the, wow, it, I, I've forgotten how many months it is now. We started these in late March, and uh, obviously, as we've done 20, this is our 21st. Uh, we have nearly uh, nearly 3,000 people have registered for the series, and uh, uh, these are being hosted and recorded by uh, uh, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutes in, uh, in the Netherlands. And at the controls there is our partner in crime, Stephen Weiber of IFLA. And we have been Gigabit Libraries working with IFLA for a number of years now on uh, uh, on public access as as a uh, a critical service that libraries provide and and really kind of the topic of today or the subtopic of today as we talk about uh, spectrum community networks uh, and libraries and how they uh, act together to uh, provide that service that uh, we would say is an essential service, especially now in, in the context of the global pandemic. Uh, all the recordings or will, this recording will be up in a couple of days on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. Gigabit Libraries is this <clears throat> open collaboration of uh, libraries doing innovative work with different kinds of technologies. Now, uh, it has really turned to uh, uh, libraries in response, uh, advocating that libraries mobilize worldwide to step forward and lead in response to uh, society's, probably the biggest challenge society civilization itself has uh, perhaps ever faced, at least in the immediate term, maybe not the biggest one uh, presently if we consider climate uh, crisis, but perhaps this, if, if we can, as a global civilization deal with this pandemic, maybe that will give us some of the tools, uh, customs, institutions even, that might address uh, the critical, as everyone is now saying, existential crisis of climate change. Uh, our speakers today, we're very fortunate to have Martha Suarez, the president of the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, and Jane Coffin, the senior VP of the Internet Society. Uh, we'll get back to them momentarily. Um, one of the points that we've been making and is relevant today is how public access is provided. The vehicles, the, the mechanics, and so forth. Mm, this Inside Out is a, is a concept that was developed or we talked about last session or the session before about libraries uh, with their buildings closed, which was the, the founding concept is what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, that's really what got us going in, when the pandemic was declared in March. It, uh, it suggests addressing several attributes of libraries if they don't have a building that's open and that's internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure. Uh, this is not the complete list, but this is a functional taxonomy that we've been using for the past several months to, to discuss this topic and what it means and what libraries are doing in response. And one of the things that they're doing is reaching out into the community. This is not a new idea for libraries, it's been a, a a mantra or a call for action for some time, but now uh, there's more need than ever to think about not only thinking outside of the so-called box, but actually being outside of the building or the box. Uh, neighborhood library access stations is a, is a, a term uh, for what many libraries yeah. are doing. Yeah. Many we're helping I'm do set up uh, these remote access stations, no, which is I'm going to take the library and I'm going to upgrade to, to first. And, uh, uh, if everybody would mute, that would be great if they're if they're not having something to say. Uh, so these access stations can be uh, 
activated, the link can be activated with a, a wireless backhaul like TV white space or five gigahertz uh, kind of long range uh, Wi-Fi uh, to create an access point. I mean, of course, you could use a wireline service uh, if that were that were uh, possible for you. But using uh, open wireless allows a library to create a, 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 a community scale network that is actually an in-house network. It's, it's a local area network, only long range using wireless technologies. And we've been doing this kind of project uh, under a grant from IMLS for the past several years. And this is the current state of the concept of these uh, neighborhood access stations. This is a kind of a combination of public phone, emergency call box, e-government kiosk, and the library Wi-Fi. And, and we're contending that these should be an easy reach of everyone, uh, not only as a, perhaps a primary source for the, for the people that lack any kind of access, but also importantly as a, a secondary or backup resource when the lights go out or your phone is dead or something like that. So uh, I don't know where the sign popped up, but that's the idea right there, you know. Uh, this is a project in Kansas that uh, we supported several years ago as a park, free Wi-Fi, uh, or wherever the library allows you to go. I mean, the internet is one place to go, certainly probably the most popular, but there are also, you know, library uh, digital services, content, and talk to a librarian, uh, databases. Uh, it's an opportunity for libraries to make physical presence. I mean, it's a virtual connection, but it's a physical place, a library space, if you will, in the community. And, and communities love their libraries for doing these kinds of things. Um, so, uh, here's a project in Georgia. They're repurposing old phone booths, old pay phone booths to be this kind of a station. Uh, we're not going to get too much into the pandemic today, or we may, depending on our speakers, but uh, it's not the only uh, crisis that, that libraries play the role of second responder. Maybe even we could say first responder in the term of, uh, in the context of a pandemic. In the what we would call normal disasters, if we can use a phrase like that, uh, you know, fires, floods, hurricanes, all of which seem to be happening today somewhere, uh, then uh, these are situations that, that blow out the capacity of our so-called first responders, you know, fire, police, ambulance, uh, and then everyone becomes a potential responder. <clears throat> but libraries and schools and other you know, public facilities like that play the role as shelters, information, communication hubs, uh, charging stations is another, another function. The point of the graph is to, is to show that the events, the frequency of these weather or climate driven weather, extreme weather events is increasing dramatically and the costs are increasing dramatically. This was all happening before COVID, it's happening during COVID. COVID seemed to not care in the least or rather we can put it the other way, that hurricanes don't seem to care in the least if there's a pandemic happening. Um, we also have a major uh, uh, challenge with uh, schools. How, how can we actually hold a school uh, with the building is closed? Well, partly closed, partly open, a little bit at home. How do we expect a, you know, uh, an eight-year-old to attend to a, a screen uh, and with a teacher talking about you know, a subject or multiple subjects over the course of an entire day. It is really uh, uh, a major challenge. Uh, this is a, a quote from our former president, uh, kind of laughable, but it, it still makes the point. But there are answers, and uh, this is just an article that popped up this morning on the New York Times, colleges everywhere now. And this is, you know, so we're, we're in a virtual, we were already virtualizing like crazy, and then suddenly the pandemic has accelerated that maybe by an order of magnitude. So it kind of poses the question, what's the difference between a virtual college and a virtual high school? I mean, is it just the course itself? It's not the campus. There are some campuses that are opening, but they're really struggling to prevent uh, you know, widespread, widespread infection. So some clever students have decided, well, if we're online, then we can really be anywhere. And I'm sick and tired of being at home. And my parents are sick and tired of having me here. And I'm paying this tuition. Uh, 
maybe there's another, a third way. And this is what uh, this article is about, that these uh, students are um, getting together and they're renting these large houses all over the place. Uh, to live together for a semester. Most of them are just committing for the one semester and, uh, you know, uh, creating something of an atmosphere that's, uh, you know, uh, not at home, not on the campus, but somewhere where fellow students are, are residing. So they're doing these contracts, how they're going to, you know, create a pod and they're all going to, you know, be responsible for certain things. It, it's kind of like a commune that has returned here uh, from the 60s in this new new environment. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, story and a, you know, an inventive kind of solution. And it's actually, the other point I wanna make on this is there's one thing that we can say about uh, Americans, I hope we can say about Americans, who are doing the worst job in responding to this pandemic worldwide, are inventive and uh, may invent our way out of this, but we better hurry. So now to the, to the main event, uh, we have uh, first up Martha Suarez, the president of Dynamic Spectrum Alliance. Um, DSA is, uh, is just the most amazing organization. I mean, we've had a number of presentations talking about spectrum, various spectrums uh, that are listed here on the screen, different projects where those are being used by libraries and, and their partners in different circumstances. Uh, and the backdrop of all that of course, is a regulatory environment, the policy that enables, defines the, the, the use rights for these various frequencies. Well, uh, I believe when we had Michael Calabrese on in June, uh, he showed that uh, spectrum map, which looked like a, a hodgepodge of, of uh, uh, you know, colors and squares and, and little segments of frequency. I mean, it, it's just daunting to look at the thing. Well, that's the environment that is that is managed by our regulator, the FCC, uh, and it's the same, you know, everywhere. Uh, all all countries are are managing their spectrum necessarily uh, as a national responsibility. There's some international, but mostly it's national, and a little bit is local, and that's a lot of uh, debate, especially in terms of rights of installing these millimeter wave radios. Uh, maybe we'll touch. Well, I guess we will touch on that. No. No, six gigahertz is not millimeter wave, so maybe we won't. But anyway, that's what we, maybe we will in terms of five, I'm sorry, 5G, we're going to also talk about. So the point is that, that Martha and DSA are uh, advocating various kinds of uh, uh, spectrum innovations, sharing spectrum, allocating spectrum for specific uses, opening more in a certain band. I mean, it's complicated. But they're doing it in the U.S. and all the, you know, at least 100 countries are having these kinds of conversations. It's incredibly important, right? How important is the phone? It's, it's vital to, to civilization operating. So uh, this, and then there's the whole uh, area of the Internet of Things, you know, very low band, small bit uh, communications between uh, devices as controllers and activators. So I'm just daunted, basically, Martha, by the, the level of complexity and the scale of the, of the challenges that you face leading this organization and the organization itself. Gigabit Libraries, happily, is, a, is one of the uh, founding members of DSA. We're an observer member. It means we don't pay dues. They allow us to sit in and and pop off from time to time, but uh, not uh, make decisions, luckily for them. So Martha, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope I didn't overdo your introduction. I, I actually underdid it and talk about your background. If you would share that with us and then take us through these, uh, these topics that we've got on the, on the agenda, specifically around 5G, the mythical 5G, and then uh, the uh, imminent arrival of six gigahertz as a new uh, Wi-Fi stream. So welcome, Martha. Thank you, Don. For Let me stop sharing here. Um, and thank you, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I have followed all the actions from uh, from uh, libraries association and in different activities. I really share uh, the goal of uh, enabling more spaces for people to connect. And I think what you're doing is, is extremely important because it's not only about getting a connection, it's what people can really do if they have that internet access. 
Um, so let's, um, I, I really think that DSA is amazing. <laughs> so thank you, Don, for that. Um, I really enjoy working with the DSA because we are testing the new technologies and I think that is the future of spectrum management. So that's very exciting. Um, and I will try to make it through a first slide, very simple. You know, when I was preparing, uh, I have a mix of slides here and there. I, I just want to uh, share some concepts with you today and have some time to discuss. So I will just share my screen quickly with this first image. Uh, this is our vision for the six gigahertz band. <clears throat> Please let me know if you can see it. Yes, we see, see the... the it's not the play version, Martha. We see the whole uh, palette. Uh, okay. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So I will explain it using a park analogy. So uh, basically, sometimes when we think about spectrum, public good. I mean, like in most of the of the countries, it's a public um, resource. And you can use it in different ways. You can just rent it. So some people can have a license for a period of time. And because of that certainty, they can build houses, uh, offices, whatever. But then you can also make the decision to keep some spectrum for public access and open. And I would compare that to parks. Both types of spectrum licensing are important. You need spectrum for licenses, uh, usage, but also it's important to have public spaces because that is a way to promote innovation and public benefit. Unfortunately, as it happens in the big, in the big cities now, it's like you, you don't always have an, a, a right place to create a park. So sometimes you need to create more interesting ways of accessing those parks. And this is a picture from, from Paris where you can see uh, in, in the lower part, there are some restaurants, shops, and in the, on the top, you have a walking uh, park, so people can go there and, and, and just take some fresh air. Um, somehow, if, I, if, if, if you take this analogy, that's an option for spectrum sharing. It's like you could have, uh, you could use a spectrum in a way that incumbent users that have been traditionally using a frequency band can continue using that band. And that could be applied to TV white spaces where the first users were broadcasters. And then you can also have more connections, especially in rural areas, and that's because of the technology. Then you can have more connections at the same time that you are protecting the broadcasters. And that is particularly true also in the case of the new generation of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6, where there are some users in the band, in the six gigahertz band, those are fixed service, uh, set fixed satellite service and other uh, mobile usages. And they can continue using that band, but at the same time, on the top of that, we can have a lot of new innovative services uh, that Wi-Fi, but not only Wi-Fi, but also a lot of devices. So I, I try to make it simple, <laughs> but, but that, this is the first concept. And, and this is a way to explain why, why dynamic spectrum access is so important. It's because we are making a more efficient use of the spectrum. <clears throat> Sorry. So more, more efficient use of the spectrum, protecting those that were initially using spectrum cases and, uh, and innovation. Um, I will quickly, and, and really I just, I just want to, to I think you have already uh, spoke about TV white spaces. I know that you had a previous session with Michael Calabrese. So I'm sure that uh, he also uh, shared his, his great view about spectrum sharing. I would like to quickly show some of the use cases that we could have with Wi-Fi 6. So there are three types of, of uses of operating devices in the 6 gigahertz span. One is standard power. So these devices are those that can operate at high power levels. I mean, for, for, for all the types of devices in the band, and they could be used for outdoor and indoor applications. So outdoor could be, for example, in a campus, in an university campus, or also in um, an airport, or it could be a stadium, or even it could be used by ISPs 
to provide internet access in rural areas. This is standard power operations need to have some coordination, some spectrum coordination with, in order to protect the incumbents. So there is a system that is named AFC in that access. There is a second type of operating class that is low power indoor. So these are the typical but improved Wi-Fi networks. So this is a, a completely new generation of Wi-Fi where we could have networks that are uh, offering high data rates, much higher than those that we had in the past, uh, devices in the, in, the, on, in the peak cases that could be about 10 gigabits per second. So it's, it's possible to have, it's also possible to handle more devices in the same network. Client devices are also, um, can, uh, can last longer. And um, we're having larger channels and uh, latency. So this is low power indoors and Wi-Fi networks. It could be only indoor, as the name said. And finally, there is also a third type of devices that are very low power. So these devices could be used, uh, for example, uh, indoors and outdoors. And for example, they could allow a lot of new use cases like virtual reality or augmented reality. Into a car, all devices connected internally and it could be a way to control different screens. Very useful for teaching, for training, because you could use um, uh, glasses that could create a complete, a complete virtual environment and so people can learn in that environment and not uh, directly on the field. So um, this is also uh, a, a great way for innovation. Every time that there is more unlicensed spectrum access, there are new cases that we cannot imagine now. So we are also expecting that this will open a lot of opportunities for new use cases and for new applications. Um, and quickly, if I can mention, this is very much related to 5G, uh, I mean Wi-Fi 6, because it is part of the ecosystem. When we are imagining 5G, I mean, the idea is that we could have uh, mobile networks with high throughputs and, and very good performance when we are moving, but at home, most probably Wi-Fi networks. And when they say at home, it also means in, in buildings and uh, public spaces, in parks, in libraries. So that those Wi-Fi networks will provide similar capabilities to those that are expected with 5G. So it will require, uh, it will be able to handle a high definition video, many connected devices and very high throughput. So that's a part of the plan. Um, I will I will stop. I'm um, finally made probably to mention that um, in terms of uh, availability, the U.S. has approved the regulations for Wi-Fi six. I mean, for unlicensed access in the six gigahertz band, and that is a very important decision because it's creating that new ecosystem for Wi-Fi six and for uh, these technologies. And because of that, industry uh, we have been working since. I think in this filing since 2017 uh, initially, and now it's a reality. So the industry is ready. According to the announcements from the Wi-Fi Alliance, it is expected to have uh, devices on the market by Christmas, and there will be more than 300 million of devices next year in the market in the US. We are also promoting this kind of approach in different countries. So we have been working closely with Brazil, with Mexico, with Colombia, in Africa. Um, it's a little bit more complicated because part of the ban would be study for, uh, for uh, cellular networks, for IMT, only in region one, in Africa and Europe. Um, so that's why you, maybe you have heard that the UK has approved and licensed access to the band, but only in, in the lower 500 megahertz of the band because the total is 1200 megahertz. Um, and that should be the case because we need a lot of spectrum for, for these kind of applications. 
So um, I think I will stop here. Um, I will be happy to discuss further. I just don't want <laughs> to, to provide a lot of uh, information here. Just to mention that we, from the DSA, we are actively promoting different, uh, um, different dynamic spectrum access technologies. Uh, connectivity and broadband coverage in places that are hard to reach. We are mainly promoting TV white spaces. For capacity and as a complement to existing networks, we are actively promoting more spectrum for Wi-Fi uh, and for uh, and licensed access in the six gigahertz band. We have been actively promoting CBRS, so that is also a very interesting the auction of the of the licenses in that band in that band were was finished and we are also promoting some different systems in millimeter waves like for example one of our members is loon and that is very interesting because we are having some kind of dynamic spectrum sharing in a 3d model because we are uh, you, you know you need to share a spectrum between fixed links uh, on terrestrial uh, frame but also you could have some um, satellite systems and some hub systems so it's it's extremely interesting and I think that this may also a more efficient use of the spectrum and providing more connectivity and uh, opportunities to react in case of emergencies so so I will stop there <laughs> but uh, happy to answer any questions you may have that's uh, that's great, Martha. The, uh, so, you didn't you didn't describe kind of the demand side. I think for more Wi-Fi. I mean, you've said that that uh, our standard Wi-Fi frequencies, two point four and five gigahertz, have been filling up. There's so many routers out there now that uh, that it's it's causing interference and it's decreasing the capacity from them to to do data transmission so this was a, a big motivation to to expand wi-fi into this additional spectrum just the crowded nature of exer existing wi-fi yes yeah, so there are two parts and that that has been recognized uh, by the fcc I, I would say three parts one is that there is congestion at peak hours, especially, and uh, and that's uh, that's a case that we have all experienced. And I think now with the COVID nineteen, we have seen the situation when we are working at home. For those that have children, there we are competing for broadband <laughs> at home. Um, so that's one case. Uh, the other case is that the demand is constantly increasing. So even without the pandemic, uh, even without the COVID nineteen situation, there are projections that shows that we need more spectrum because users are requesting more and more and more uh, broadband and more access and they are having more multimedia uh, actions. And there is a third aspect. It's not only about congestion, it's about new use cases. There are many use cases that basically cannot operate in 2.5 or 5 gigahertz because they need more bandwidth. And it's like a highway. If you imagine you have many lanes you just need additional ones because otherwise you cannot transport different systems or different technologies so for example for virtual reality augmented reality you need 160 megahertz bandwidth channels and that's not simply not possible or not enough with, with the spectrum that it's already there so it's also a way to enable new use cases and innovation and it's also open spectrum as you pointed out it's it's a public spectrum so anyone can use it right like wi-fi i mean it is wi-fi and well like tv white space you just uh, acquire certified equipment and it and you can do anyone can do data communications this is this is especially interesting because uh, it allows anyone to create their own network uh even wide area networks which is difficult concept for most people. They don't. They can. They understand. They can have a network in their office or their home, but the idea that they could have a network that reaches across the community is a hard one for people to imagine. They think it's you know kind of super engineering. Well, it is, but they've reduced that engineering into these very capable uh, equipment that can be managed by most people. The point that I guess I'm trying to make here is uh, this supports uh, a general DIY. Uh, effort at creating these these networks uh, and so 
so Wi-Fi 6 is, as you said, it'll, it, it has the lower power, the way we know most of us use Wi-Fi for, you know, in, out, in office, in home, and then the higher power to do longer range connections where you have line of sight, I believe, uh, to correct, connect the remote location and do high, high bandwidth. So this is exciting. Uh, development into the year Christmas. So uh, compatibility, we these will automatically be compatible with all of our our end user devices. It will take a while. So every new technology is compatible with the previous ones, but it, it doesn't mean that you will. I mean, you will need the complete. Uh, you will need the client device and the router to be Wi-Fi six E compatible. So just also to clarify, Wi-Fi six has been there for a while because that was approved by the Wi-Fi Alliance last year. So some people might have already some some smartphones that are Wi-Fi six. The new thing is that Wi-Fi six E is using the six gigahertz spectrum and then it's uh, providing more capabilities. So those are the routers that we expect to be in the market by Christmas. And then uh, once you start to have that ecosystem, it would give you uh, the opportunity to smoothly uh, make the transition to new networks. So that's, that's basically how users will, will find that. So how do we know if we have those or not? Not yet, because it has been just approved in, uh, I mean, Wi-Fi 6E, not yet, because it was just approved in April. But Wi-Fi 6 is already, is, is, you, you will see this, the, the design on, on the smartphones. I think just the last ones had them, like Samsung and Apple, the last uh, generations. Well, this is great. This is a, a great new tool because Wi-Fi is the general uh, technology that underpins public access. I mean... I, I guess you could plug in, you know, to an Ethernet cable somewhere, not if you have a Macintosh, but you know. um, so this will this will this will create a lot of opportunities. I think uh, there's yeah. a question. There are some uh, Sorry, and I just want to mention that yep. that's completely true. There are some numbers that say that half of the traffic through Internet is starting or ending in a Wi-Fi network. So it's a lot. I mean, yeah. like if, you, if you really consider that, it's like billions of users everywhere around the world. I'm surprised it's not more, frankly, uh, because, <laughs> you know, we're the, the, the cell systems, you know, they're amazing. But, you know, at a certain point, you're, you're consuming too much data. And uh, so people are looking to offload uh, their their data plans from their phone systems onto uh, Wi-Fi somewhere or other. Uh, there's a question from Todd about uh, the ability of Wi-Fi 6 to uh, penetrate, uh, you know, obstructions. Uh, and so is this going to be more or less the same as it is with uh, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi or will it be a little more limited because of higher frequency? It's quite similar. So if you compare in terms of performance, uh, 2.45 and 6 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz is really providing more throughput and lower latency. But in terms of coverage, it's quite similar. It's a little bit less because just it's higher frequency. Uh, it's similar to 5 gigahertz, but you cannot compare it. I mean, if you are trying to have a last mile connection for a few uh, kilometers, you, you will I mean, this is not the best technology you could use. In those cases, you can just use TV white spaces because that will provide that great capability of, uh, of having good propagation, even if there is no line of sight. So th that's when you start combining technologies. Also in some places where you don't have backhaul, sometimes you need satellite backhaul. But you have many projects around the world that are you get a, a satellite link and then you create a Wi-Fi network. We have been discussing with ISPs in Brazil and they say that for them this is great because sometimes they can have a link uh, to, to a farm but there are some places that are large so it's very hard to provide enough Wi-Fi coverage uh, and with en enough capacity in bands that are, might be already uh, saturated. So for them, uh, I think they could have like this kind of hybrid networks. They could have uh, uh, Wi-Fi 6 as a way to provide better connectivity for, for the, in, in, in a particular area, and also the capability to handle more devices. Also, uh, we found that very interesting in Brazil. Some people just get a broadband plan and they share it with their neighbors. So it's not like you have a plan at home. 
it's like they just it's too expensive so they just group some houses and they pay for a link and they share it so sure. they were completely um, happy <laughs> with, with the option of having your devices and efficiently and, and being able to create yeah this will come as an addition to what we yeah. have it's not like you you will need to sacrifice something this will be additional spectrum for uh, better connectivity and, and additional use cases. I think we're gonna see a, a very positive effect from this. There's one question related to uh, 6E and E rate. Uh, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, it depends, uh, Candace. The, if it's used, I mean, yes, is the, is the quick answer. It's uh, applicable under E-rate, uh, but there are the two, there's the two categories of E-rate. One is the in-house connectivity, category two. So this is just another version of, of Wi-Fi in-house. And then category one, where you might link the library itself or a remote library kiosk or a bookmobile or something using high-powered uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6 in this, in this case. And so that would be a category one uh, uh, eligibility. So yes, is the, is the answer for that. Uh, it may create some more interesting uh, circumstances, but I, it seems like it's going to fall right into the existing use regulations. So, okay, we, um, we didn't talk a lot about millimeter wave, but I think we're going to maybe dive into that at a later time. Uh, it is one of the components of 5G. This is sits right in the middle of it, so-called mid-band, very important part uh, of uh, the, the whole use spectrum. But I think we need to turn to our second uh, uh, guest speaker, Jane Coffin, uh, a, a longtime uh, colleague and good egg, as we say. Uh, Jane is has been rising through the ranks of uh, of uh, the Internet Society for a number of years. Uh, she has worked near and far on uh, a whole range of issues. Spectrum is one of those. Public access is definitely one of those, and particularly how uh, community networks, uh, that is to say, wide area networks where communities are providing for themselves uh, the, the connectivity that's not being provided by the market. <laughs> which as we know, in a lot of places, it just doesn't seem to be profitable with the current technologies and business models. So Jane, you are with us. I think I saw you somewhere. I am, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Jane, great. Uh, we oh, can see you too. I've had audio issues all morning, so I'm glad it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so tell us how, uh, we'll, we'll have Martha's description of these, these various new resources. How does that play into uh, community networks and how do libraries fit into community networks and how does all that expand what is generally called public access? Absolutely, and thank you, Don, for having um, us here. Uh, we've been following your series through my colleague Kelly, who's part of our North American chapter lead, and others yep. on the call um, for quite some time. And we think this was just such a great idea um, to bring people together. And for the library folks on the call, my parents were both English teachers, so um, <laughs> I come from a long history of people that are strong supporters of libraries. Um, and to continue the, the theme with DSA, um, we've just joined DSA. We're really proud to be a member. Um, we're just always impressed with the work Marta had done as well when she was in the government in um, Colombia. But Don, you were one of the first uh, humans that had talked to me really about DSA being very important to the, the movement of changing the way people look at spectrum. Um, my background is from both the US government where I worked for an agency that does national spectrum um, work. Uh, it's called NTIA. I wasn't on the spectrum team, but I often interfaced with them when I was doing international work. So we actually used the DSA meeting in, in Bogota, Colombia in 2016 to reboot our um, community network work. Um, I brought many of our regional experts from around the world to Colombia so that we could talk to some of the, the movers and shakers in Latin America on the community network side. Uh, people like Redes Comunica, um, Reza Marica, Altormundi, and some others. And as Marta has mentioned, Brazil is always a bit of an innovator along with Colombia, Argentina, and Mexico with different types of use of spectrum or licensing or ways to fund 
um, community networks actually. And so we've been um, watching this with our team around the world and been a strong supporter of change. And we're not talking about radical reinvention of um, spectrum allocation assignments because we don't want to alarm governments, but we do think change is needed. Um, whether it's spectrum sharing, direct allocation, secondary use. So we support the DSA um, focus. We support the libraries and trying to become more um, hubs for connectivity, the work Michael Calabrese is doing and others, and um, the community networks themselves, because we've seen, for example, a network in sub, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Africa, in what's called the Eastern Cape. Um, it's called Zenzeleni. They have been working closely with the South African government to try and get them to change their minds on how Spectrum works. Um, we've been impressed with the Mexican government, who actually was the first government to give a direct allocation of Spectrum to a community network in Oaxaca. It was a bottom-up network where you're finding that the community itself is running, as Don said, DIY. We often will say it's with the community, by the community, for the community. Um, that network in Oaxaca, Mexico, not only had the direct spectrum allocation, but a license, a special type of license called a social purpose license for the indigenous community there in Oaxaca. And that has caught on like wildfire, the use of special purpose licenses, because regulators and policymakers, if there's political will, can find a way. And I think, as Marta said, the 6G allocation with the FCC and the opening up, that was really driven by COVID and also driven by people like Marta and others. And quietly, the CN is pushing to say, what are we doing? People don't have access. Um, networks like the New York City Mesh in New York were actually wiring up people for the first time and children and parents both were using the networks obviously to study and to work. And so it's been surprising to us to see not only in the United States, but around the world where community networks are pushing the margin on the use of spectrum as well as the libraries, of course. And I give a shout out here to Stephen, who's on the call and the team at IFLA and IFL and others where we have found common cause with libraries because we share the same concept of community access connectivity. I've been doing this for 20 years. I do not understand why we haven't gotten this uh, sorted in so many countries. And um, often on panels that I'm speaking on, I will say COVID is keeping us accountable for what we did not accomplish to connect people. Sure. But now we have the opportunity. And I hate to, I hope this doesn't sound too mercenary, but let's use the challenge we have, UNICEF published a report today about the number of children that will be out of school. I think for all of you that do so much work with children in libraries and others and have kids, it's a staggering number of children that will be out of, out of school and potentially not using internet because they don't have it at home. My mother, who is a former teacher, is very excited about this and she said to me, Maine has got to get their act together. I'm like, there's a great library people. There are great library people in Maine, mom. They're, they're on it. They're working with the government. But even people like my 79 year old mother is pretty exercised by the fact that there's not more connectivity in certain places because we're on coast, we're in coastal Maine. But back to the point, we are strong supporters on change with spectrum policy. It has to go hand in hand with allowing more community access entities. I think Don, the right word is anchor institutions that came out of that um, exercise under the, uh, the legislation years ago with the NTIA. And so with anchor institutions, we will promote the use of um, more spectrum allocation to libraries, schools, anywhere that you can find in some countries that may not be a, a, a school, they may not have libraries, it could be a, just a community center. We are not advocates of just standing up a community center for the sake of it. It has to have a plan with a broadband plan or a connectivity plan. Um, we're careful with our language when it comes to broadband because you may be a, you may obviate some people who are in places where they can't keep up the broadband speeds with the community network. So we're super careful about a glide path, right? And it's something we've been advocating in different places. Um, so as to the work we do with community networks, we have teams all over the world, um, staff in 30 something countries speaking 27 languages. And we're super focused in places like the Republic of Georgia where we've been working with the government, our own chapter, because a shout out, we have over 120 chapters around the world. This has been a huge success with the ISP Association, the government of Georgia, an economic re uh, redevelopment fund in Georgia, 
USAID's jumped into the bandwagon, the World Bank, the Czech Development Agency, where we started up a small network in the very high mountains of Georgia. It actually got some attention in the New York Times, thankfully in the business section, Don, and not the uh, travel section <laughs> a couple of years ago, where people realized that you can do it yourself. And what we're also pushing here, and it's the backstory for a lot of the countries that we're working in, when you have old incumbent monopoly network mentalities and telco mentalities in some countries versus the more distributed bottom up, y'all come open, <laughs> innovative, uh, sort of the internet approach, um, we still see barriers to connectivity. And so we're still fighting that incumbent mentality or the duopoly mentality in some places. We will hang our hat on countries like Brazil and Mexico who are opening things up, South Africa who's giving it a go. Uganda, who had us on a panel recently, where my colleague Max, who runs our CN team, I oversee that team, but he's one of the project leads. He was speaking on this panel where the new regulator in Uganda was like, this is important. Our country has to change. We have a crisis. We need people to connect. Don, what this also does as far as, you know, more concentrated and better and open focused connectivity plans in countries, it means that ministries have to break down the walls and work together. They have to stop being the rival education ministry and the rival communications ministry, where people are working together. We're hearing this more and more. Countries like Egypt, where the education minister for the first time took his meetings online. He was so excited because COVID forced everybody to connect with him online. So what we're doing is we don't want to use this opportunity um, in a sensational way, but use it in a very constructive way and say, it's time. You know, let's use complementary forms of access, which could be at the library, it could be the community network uh, in a small town. The key thing is backhaul out of those towns to other big networks. Martin knows a lot about this. We've been urging governments to talk to some of the other companies so that we can cut a deal. You give us backhaul, we'll connect here. The, the reason that there are often these deals that need to be cut is that the GSMA has put out a note about four years ago that said for communities of 5,000 and under, many of the mobile operators had a difficult time of getting a return on investment. Mm -hmm. What that meant is the older model, which is not a bad model. I'm not, I'm not uh, going after the, the big operators, but I'm just saying if they can't connect at a return on investment rate, what are they doing? They often are not connecting and or finding longer glide paths, which don't help. So if community networks or libraries can be those anchors and get back call from some of these incumbents, then the licensing obligations can be met jointly. There's a way to do this. Also part of our, our work involves, again, I mentioned licensing, the focus on spectrum and new and creative ways of funding entities that need funds, whether it's changing E-rate, which you all know a lot more about than I do, but I'm a strong proponent of it. We put out a note saying, change E-rate, talk to like Dawn and everybody, um, but universal service funds, those are broken. They're not, the funds are barely distributed in some developing countries and emerging markets. And the question is, why not now? Why not fund community networks and other commercial startups, the small startup networks? Um, that's what's been happening in some countries where we're seeing a nonprofit model go into a quasi for profit model. In South Africa, it was bottom up community network. They bought a tower. Now they're a WISP that's doing some commercial service. So the commercial side is funding the nonprofit side. There are lots of models. It's not the same everywhere, obviously. Every country, every state, every region has its own characteristic, but we've been using um, the platform of community networks and connectivity, not just at the local local level where we know the local sustainability is driven by local people, but we crank that up to the regional level and we're working with regional communications groups to promote this concept of change, support the DSA's uh, work, get the focus in on the technical side so there isn't a fear about community networks. We had people suggesting they were terrorist networks a couple of years ago at a treaty conference. We said, really? Gosh, no. <laughs> you know? and, and I even was in the Republic of the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia last, last summer talking to some of their people about the fact that they need to make it work in their country the way it is doable, if it's through a library. And they were very keen to look at that. Um, again, in other places, it, it's a more normal situation where it might be just through the community network, just standing up its own network itself. They're usually Wi-Fi, but in some countries, they're Wi-Fi fixed and mobile. So Wi-Fi, which is one of the more famous networks in Spain, uh, in the uh, Barcelona region, um, started out along with Freifunk in Germany years and years ago. 
So a lot of the European community networks were the, the model for some of the, um, what we see today. And so what we often will do, and this has been a little bit harder this year, uh, we're doing it virtually now. One of the great things that I think we, one of our sweet spots is the convening of people in regions. And it's also not just around the planet, but in the United States, we're working hard with tribal communities. We jumped into the tribal priority window work with some colleagues to help boost toward the end there. Um, got on radio for the first time uh, in our history at, at the Internet Society, working through Jeff Blackwell, who used to run the Native American Affairs Office at the FCC, working with Matt Rantanen and others, because this is all about a community of people working together to strengthen that community of interest. And so it takes, as they say, it takes a village, it takes more than a village. It takes a village, a nation, a region, and global efforts so that we focus at global, inter so the international global, the regional, and the local. And that way we can really layer it up and down sort of strategically and tactically to work with great partners like many of you on this call. So it's, it is a strong focus on the technology from our side, but we don't do anything without our partners. And we also know that it takes a community of effort, whether it's a library community or a community on the ground that just is tired of not having good connectivity. And I will give one more pitch to community networks during COVID where we've, um, they're putting out message boards to try and make sure there's good data coming out to communities in Kibera, in Kenya, South Africa, and other places so that more information about the medical reality, um, how to take care of yourself and the community better um, during the pandemic. We've really been a linchpin in communities and we're working hard with them on sustainability factors and getting the messages out there. So you may see us coming back to many of you with some ideas on pitches that we're going to give or more data we want to put out there or case studies so that other people can just look and adopt and adapt because we are very keen to make sure that when we go and work with communities it's a listening approach this is not a we know better than the community and we often we do not go where we're not asked to go obviously don't impose ourselves but we do have a, a really strong, um, like I said before, a chapter network. We have org members that believe in what we do. We're not a trade association. We're a principle-based organization about the openness, uh, importance of open, innovative use of connectivity um, and open standards, which I think is something embraced by the library community as well. So just a thank you, Don, for giving us a cameo here and all the work that you've been doing too with your colleagues and to thank Marta, Michael, others on the call. I don't wanna miss people, so I'll stop saying the who's, but thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> but spectrum change has to happen, and I'll just leave you with this thought. I worked in Armenia to help build a regulator in from 2003-ish uh, to 2006. When I first met with something called the Republican Center, which was their spectrum center, I found out that 99% of the spectrum was used by the government. They had some active border conflicts at that time. The new mobile operator that came in while I was there couldn't believe that there was no spectrum that was being made available through the regulator, which we had created together. And so when you start to realize how far some countries have come in opening up their spectrum, we're working with Armenia now on a community network, it's encouraging, but you still have a lot of old mentality about guarding spectrum for national security or guarding spectrum for just national use. And so opening up markets is very important too. So we want to give a pitch to the private sector, uh, the work that Marx is doing and others to we're fully enable uh, fully on board with that. It's but let's let's figure out a way to share it. I think Michael has a great saying it's something like if you're not sharing, if you're not using it, let's share it. We're with him on that. <laughs> um, but I'll stop talking. And I just uh, the last thing I will say is that sharing data which libraries are so good at is something we're keen to promote. Open data is something Steve Song is pushing and we're pushing through something called the UN Broadband Commission. UNESCO is a big part of that. I know some people have views on some UN agencies that's not doing much. There are a lot of people who are very dedicated in UNESCO. Um, Moez Chukchuk, who comes out of Tunisia is the second there and he's amazing. We're working with him now to, to promote more on community networks, but also the ITU development sector D with Doreen Bogdan has been doing amazing work to support it. So we've turned the tide through the community of interest and the grassroots movement coming in uh, in a collaborative way to look at collaborative management policy and regulatory change. So I'm very optimistic and I think we just have to keep moving forward together 
like you said, Don, there's opportunity, be positive. Um, there are tricky things going on in the world, but we really can't miss out on this opportunity at the grassroots level, library, working with all of you at, at your choice and, and how, to, how we can help. And Kelly, who's on this call, is keen to help set up more chapters <laughs> to do more work. So if you're interested in talking to her about what we do with chapters, uh, just ask her. But um, there's a way to uncrowd a spectrum. And I think Marta and team know a lot about that. So we're here to support that as well, because people will say the spectrum is too crowded. Well, we're not talking about an enormous use when it comes to a community network. And so we need to change the mindset, really. The political will has to shift. And I think we have a great opportunity to do that. So thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Fantastic, Jane. Uh, you've covered so much ground here. Uh, you know, I only have about 20 questions, but uh, we'll have to defer uh, some of those. Uh, but you make a great point about uh, opportunity uh, and necessity. Uh, that's, that's, I think, what's different now is that this necessity has created new opportunities because people are just more serious because of just, I don't know, mortality perhaps is a little closer to us these days than, than usually. Uh, and, and your point about backhaul being uh, essential and, and the, the whole approach you've used at, at, at fostering community development uh, of these networks is so smart. Uh, we've, we've said you can't really push fiber. You know, you can't push string. It has to be pulled. Somebody at the other end has to say, we want that. We know what it is and we value it. So, you know, help, just release it and we'll pull it in. Uh, but there has to be something there to pull and that, that backhaul is a critical piece. There are ways to operate offline. We've seen some very imaginative uh, network strategies, community network strategies that are kind of semi-autonomous uh, subsets of the internet. But the use of, um, what I wanna get to is government obligation here, but the use of uh, not only spectrum, but the funds are derived from the market of telecom to try to connect everybody. That's the principle of universal service. <clears throat> and, and can we, can we, are, are you sensing that governments have a new sort of recognition of the importance that everybody needs to be connected? Can they be, can they be felt to made ob obliged to uh, provide access to, let's just start with public information and government services, which, you know, how else you get that? I mean, the health information, education, of course. Uh, now, do you feel there's a different understanding that, that governments are having I think there are many governments who are sensing um, the urgency due to public dismay that their kids are going back to school and can't learn at home, or that more and more people are putting pressure on the network. We've seen the internet, of course, not fall down. We're very happy about that. It's a technology that is still uh, doing its thing. Um, internet exchange points have stood up, right? And we're seeing the importance of complementary access. So I think they're more willing to have that conversation now. I've seen a more open attitude. And I think that the political pressure is really going to push them in a direction that we can help them leverage. Um, I should say, I forgot to mention national research and education networks. I don't want to forget NRENs. They're big pipes. And there is more models right now where the NRENs are looking at wholesale retail models, where they could be something down there on the public access side. Um, I think Lewis Fox is one of the big innovators there from Scenic, and it might be worth chatting with him more in the future on that, because it has to be a more um, systemically integrated plan now, not just the standalone from the comms and the regulatory side. Um, I should also make a pitch for Dustin Loop, who's on this call from our, ch our chapter in DC. Dustin had started up a conversation with a community in Baltimore, which just landed on the nightly news. I think it was NBC the other day. Um, and hit some major press where he's helped stand up a community network with some youth in the inner city in Baltimore. These, these kids were amazing. They just said, you know what? This is not something we're gonna stand by and watch. We're gonna do something about. So we think you're seeing more and more of that. And it was something that someone mentioned in the chat about kids getting together to study. Let's harness that energy because it's there. <laughs> um, but I do see a change done at the, at the global level too. And we have to figure out a way to make sure we're messaging this properly so they don't think the community networks are flaky and not something that will stand up. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's, 
there's no way around the government. I mean, people say, oh, we, we built it. We, you know, we built it ourselves or the universities built it, you know, something like that. But all of this happens within the context of governments. National governments absolutely are the primary province of spectrum policy uh, and universal service uh, uh, funds. However, those funds are being managed or mismanaged it still gets back to that. The, the, just the ability to have a business, you know, to, to per, give a permit to a private business, a co-op, you know, it, we, there's no way around our use of governments to affect the will as, you know, people, as, as publics. So um, they're necessary, but they're very difficult sometimes because of the way things work. And we had a question about uh, corporations or, uh, it was a general description of corporations. Maybe it meant the difference between uh, providers and other types of uh, corporate entities. Let's say big tech, which are not in the provision business. How do you see those those interests working for this kind of opening uh, policy in uh, in supporting community networks or or strategy? Uh, you know, where where's big tech on this? Are they they seem like they have all the money? Why don't they have a, a concomitant amount of power that can open up? Uh, uh, these uh, uh, these resources. They're quietly doing that. They're trying not to be too uh, public about it. Actually, um, some of the big content delivery networks are keenly working in the background quietly because they don't want it to look like, from what I know, um, and the limited groups that we're working with, um, they don't want it to make it seem like that they're trying to pull some sort of regulatory policy stunt, right? There are some very dedicated people in these in these companies trying hard right now. Um, we've had outreach from some major providers as well. Um, and also a bank recently came to us uh, through some other partners. And um, we'll be getting a big grant to do some work in the southeast part of the United States. So for folks in the southeast US, hang tight. We may be back in touch and just contact me or Kelly and we'll see if we can loop you in because we've been asked to help build at least five community cooperatives. So community networks that are cooperating across different entities. Um, Chris Mitchell, of course, at ILSR is uh, one of the key fellows who's been doing work in that space. So we'll be putting together a program committee to work on this. Um, it really is something that companies are realizing they need to pull together to do um, because it is more of a we versus just a, a one-off on some of this. Now, there are some tech companies that may not be interested at all, but I think we just have to find those that are. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to imagine you could be a tech company and not be interested in connecting. I know, it'd be kind of interesting and this is an opportunity and uh, they're all having to have folks work from home too. So with the bank that reached out to us, online banking, it's probably through the roof, right? And so uh, there's more, there's more better local content delivery networks are needed and or a network, right? Yeah. So whether it's through the schools and libraries and um, community networks working together, there's got to be a way to stand more up. Also with the, the security, of course. Um, I did want to note that I know Marta did this when she was in Columbia and she may want to speak to this, but we have to pull down some of the local bureaucracy or bureaucraticness with applications for whether it's spectrum, we have to see where it's more available. I think some of the spectrum agencies need to make some of the, the the lingo they use on their website a little bit easier to understand for basic people and also make sure they have really um, clear ways to contact people about how spectrum is allocated and assigned. This was a subject of a report we did with Steve Song and Carlos Ray Moreno and Mike Jensen from APC and Mozilla. Um, it's on our website, but we it's a it's a sort of a a survey of global, regional, local, but one of the key points that they found was they were trying to research, you know, how you get access to Spectrum, and it was a, a morass on some of the websites. And so, some regulators are really great, like the UK regulator at Ofcom, and I know Marta was improving things in Colombia and the guys in Mexico at Ifitel. So, governments I think are realizing there's more focus on them, so they have to find ways to be more open about how to do something. Um, but I'll be yeah. quiet, so maybe Martha no, can we'll give, we'll give Martha a chance at that. But but you, it, it suggests an important point. I would say that we are advocating to these regulators, we as anchor institutions, uh, for more funding. You know, more universal use of universal search funds, and and there's always a struggle over over money, right? At the same time, these same people, these same agencies, 
have control of a massive valuable resource as spectrum, which doesn't cost them anything. It's the public's property in the first place anyway. Now you may make a case for opportunity cost, but still it is, uh, it is the balanced side of funding for wireline is making availability of spectrum for, uh, for connectivity infrastructure. Martha, uh, Jane was asking about the, well, you heard about uh, uh, making information about spectrum more available at the local level. You're muted, Martha. Yes, definitely, um, and I agree. We, we, in Colombia, when I was working with the government, we organized a hackathon, and the name was very funny because we made, the title was how to make spectrum visible, <laughs> how to see spectrum. And it was, you know, we were trying to get some ideas. It was, uh, many people just came to participate in that hackathon. They had very nice ideas. And at the end, we had a complete change in the website. I think we, we, we didn't completely succeed on that, but we tried to create, maybe I will share this link. This is where I was working in the past. And it's a platform, and if you are, it asks you, are you community, a, a, a citizen? Are you looking for specialized information? Are you another government institution? So you have like different uh, options because it's not the same language. That, that's the hard part for regulators. It's like if you, most of people are asking about power levels, uh, licenses, how to get to the process. That, that is completely different to the information that sometimes citizens need. They just need to know like, what, what can I do? How, how can I get more access to connectivity? So I definitely think that is important. That's the first part. But then also what many regulators are missing is to have uh, good information. Like when you start seeing like, okay, how, where do you have the information about all the licenses? What I see most of the time is that it's Excel and it's not completely updated. And, and not because they don't want is that most of the time those are small teams and they have a lot of work with ongoing actions and tasks. So they don't have the time to, to really <laughs> improve the way that that management is done. So I think that is also part of the advocacy actions is to try to understand that situation. That's the reality uh, and, and try to help, you know, it's like, okay, uh, dynamic spectrum access, the first thing you know is, is to, to have the details about the incumbents. That would be the only way to protect them. Uh, in other countries, you also have illegal users. That is not so common in the US, but in, in, in LATAM it's very common that you have uh, broadcast stations that are just there. <laughs> uh, so so it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it, it needs a, a good understanding of the field, of the situation that regulators face in order to really support them yeah. implementing them great great well we, we're running over a little bit but i want to give our speakers uh, uh one more chance to uh uh close with some call to action uh martha you're on right now what what would you what would you suggest of uh libraries around the world uh in the context of uh what you know of resources and and how they might help the uh, the evolution development of, of more uh, spectrum resources. Um, uh, putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, first, first, I, um, I, I, I would uh, not talk as only as DSA, but the situation I'm seeing now, I'm not in Bogota. I'm in the side. And I see children from the community. It's really the countryside. And they were taking lessons using WhatsApp. Uh, so basically, that's how teachers are sending them the content. They, they see what they have to do. They work at home and then they send that by WhatsApp or they walk one hour to go to school and, and provide that. So I think it's not only about high tech, about the last deployment. That's important because it's efficient, but it's about creating links and creating synergies. So, so I think that is the hardest part because each of us is used to work on, on, on our specialty, specialty field. So, okay, I talk about spectrum, I talk about frequencies and power levels, uh, but, but it's, sometimes we miss the community reality. And also I think in your case, you're also dealing with libraries and day-to-day -day actions. And it's very important you're taking the time to consider options for connectivity. So 
done, I really think what you're doing is great <laughs> because you're just bringing people together um, and just keep in touch. You know, we're we are working, uh, Jane mentioned different projects. We're working in South Africa, in Brazil, in Colombia, uh, of course, in the US. So, so I think it's just know that we are there. And if you need anything, just reach. If you have any idea, just reach and, and, and let's try to work together. I think that is the right direction. Right. And, and you make a point about, you know, libraries are great at collaborating and, uh, and, and working on anything. You know, they have the, the widest uh, set of uh, blinders, I think, of any institution. Uh, Jane, uh, what, uh, what would be your, your call to action here uh, as we close out today's session? For all of us to promote the concept of complementary forms of access and all those things that go with it, um, changing spectrum, looking at licensing and funding, Don, and uh, a call to action on universal access, perhaps, because that would be a way for us to drive this forward. But it's complementary forms of connectivity that will get us there, whether it's libraries through the big entities that are out there, but also the community networks. So that would be my call to action. Wonderful. Don't stop Great. it. Promote it. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> Before we close, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute. Could you unmute everyone, please? Unmute, because uh, we'd like to give our, our, our very special guests a, a round of applause. Oh, this is fascinating, nice. wonderful thank stuff you. today. Thanks, Don. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well done. Thank you. Uh, really good. Thank you all. This was fun. Yeah. Aloha. 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 <laughs> yeah, that will conclude today's yeah. session. Uh, that once a year. Well, I'll be yeah. back next week. And uh, with that, we will close the recording. Okay.